ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته um i have chosen a topic which um is slightly in relation to brotherhood and unity um perhaps what the messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do in relation to this topic uh, this is a topic which a lot of people speak about and it's perhaps very pertinent in today's day and age because we are in a situation not only locally but nationally internationally where we find that there is a great deal of division amongst muslims in every way so um i thought i would choose perhaps this topic um just in relation to unity that um allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed us in the quran Uh, in Surah Al-Imran Ya ayya ladhina amanu taqullu haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun wa'tasimu bi hablillah jami'a wa la tafarraqu Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala started with this topic of unity this whole chapter in the Quran in Al-Imran began with this word, began with this verse Ya ayya ladhina amanu taqullu haqqa tuqatih O you who believe fear Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala And this fear, fear generally speaking, is of various types and of various kinds. What we call the khawf. There is that one type of abject fear which is the fear of a coward, which is not worthy for any man. This is a type of fear which nobody should have, especially a Muslim. Why? Why? because a muslim is somebody who has an elevated status amongst mankind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the muslim to have a elevated status amongst mankind because of the sheer fact that he is a muslim that's it that he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he enjoins that which is good and he forbids that which is evil so this accolade this title comes with those conditions It's no good just to say that I'm a Muslim and therefore I'm better than anybody else. It doesn't work like that. This title, this status, superior status comes with these conditions attached. So especially for the Muslim, this kind of abject fear should not exist, not worthy for any man. And today unfortunately it is reared its ugly head in the Muslim community. Particularly because there is this false fear that we have. that if we say and do anything then what will end up happening is that we will be labeled even when we've got legitimate campaigns for us as muslims that we can argue about and we can even perhaps fight for in muslim countries we find that there are those muslims who have this type of fear will not speak about that so in office places in workplaces in colleges or universities neutral topics perhaps the hijab the khimar the niqab you know neutral not contentious topics at all and perhaps it exists more in france or in other european countries than here but it's an opportunity for us to start to examine these ideas that there may come a time where we will find that we are in the same or a similar situation to those european countries where this muslim will not defend these ideas at all not defend the notion of a khimar or a jabab or niqab or the right for that person to dress as they wish mean with a khimar with a jilbab with a niqab like france when they've banned this so muslims have this fear that they don't even want to entertain a neutral topic then you've got those contentious topics like obviously occupation of muslim land and you got all of a sudden then those muslims who have this fear will jump on that bandwagon not because they believe it's a duty or responsibility or because they have this courage to do that is because they are behind somebody else so you will find socialist workers party will jump on this bandwagon of viva palestine free palestine and all of a sudden you find these muslims who have never practiced in their life at all and have this fear of a coward 
that they will never defend Islam, never defend Muslims. In fact, in workplaces, they're the first people to attack Islam and Muslims. Yeah, yeah, those people are extremists, those people are terrorists. We don't believe in the beard, we don't believe in this. No, 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 I'm completely neutral, I'm all on your side. I'm not different to you. I'm called Muhammad and you're called Bob, that's the only difference. But when it comes to these campaigns, they will jump on these campaigns because they are behind somebody else. So that, that somebody else, whoever they may be, whichever organization it may be, then becomes a shield for them. So this, unfortunately, this, and the media is to blame, blame as well because it has created a frenzied hatred against Islam and against Muslims. So this, there's this notion or this idea and it's a perceived idea that we are going to be labelled, we're going to lose our positions and our job, so on and so forth. People are going to look down upon us if we don't make our position clear on these neutral issues. So unfortunately, this idea of, or this type of fear has reared its head in the Muslim community. And we, particularly as Muslims, should try to stay away from it completely. Then you have the other type of fear of you know, the fear of a dan- the danger of a child. You know, a child is not sure about something or an individual is an inexperienced individual is not sure about a particular thing, um, a particular action. So this type of fear, uh, perhaps a husband or a wife may have before they get married. They're inexperienced and they don't know what the life is going to be like. A child doesn't know before they embark or before he, you know, plays with a particular toy or sees adults that they've never seen. So this type of fear exists amongst children or inexperienced people as well. Then you have the other type of fear where it's akin to reverence, you know, reverence or uh, love, akin to love. And this is normally the case where you will find that people are scared or afraid to do something which is contrary to the object of love. And this is a type of fear that also exists. And this is the type of fear which is the seedbed of Iman for us as Muslims that we should have. And for those of us who love our parents, or love our children, or love our spouses, you ask yourself the question that you will not do something which that person doesn't like. If your mother doesn't like something, you know, perhaps a particular type of clothing that you wear, whenever you go and visit them, you won't wear that type of clothing. Why? Because it's displeasing to the object of love. Your wife may not like something that you may do, or your husband may not like something that you may do. So it becomes displeasing to the object of love. So it's akin to reverence, so you stay away from it. This is the type of fear that we should have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the type of fear that we should have for Allah. Why? Because we claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونَ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ that say that if you love me, then follow me, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. This is the type of fear that we as Muslims should be working towards. And the rest of the type of fears, we should try to leave them to the side. And this is the only type of fear that we as Muslims should have. The type of fear that when we do something, that we think twice about it, is this pleasing to the object of love to Allah. That should always come to our mind. And it's easy perhaps, you know, to, um, to exemplify this with other human beings. Why? Because you have people in front of you, the children in front of you whom you love, you know. So you don't hit them, you don't raise your hand at them because you love them. Or you buy them gifts and toys every time you come back from work because you have this love and affection for them. Or for the wife or the husband, the mother or the father or your teacher. So in the same way, or in, in, with a higher similitude, we should also have this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَاَعْتَسِمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعٌ وَلَا تَفَرَّقُ Hold fast to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hold fast to the rope of Allah, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُ And do not be divided. So this is a command from Allah. It's a duty upon us that we hold fast to the rope of Allah. And the ulama, the scholars have said that the robe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Quran and Sunnah. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. So there shouldn't be any confusion in our minds. What is the robe of Allah? How do we become united? And so a lot of people talk about this idea of unity. And if this idea or this notion of 
this unison in all of the Muslim communities, the different denominations, firqa that exist, or the communities that exist, different countries that we are from. If this type of unity is not based upon Quran and Sunnah, this will never last. It will never exist. And people do come together for other reasons. People come together for a patriotic bond. Like now, we have the Olympics coming up in Stratford. So each nation will gather behind its flag, gather behind its leaders, gather behind those whom are representing that nation. But it will be temporary. It will be for three weeks. It will be for four weeks. Those same individuals, those same supporters of this particular sport, who follow these sports individuals and celebrities, will then go back to their countries and they will fight amongst each other. So in this country, those sports individuals, those sports you know, um, um, fans, that will rally behind those individuals, those celebrities that are fighting for this gold and silver <coughs> and this status and these bronze medals, once the Olympics is over, they will fight amongst each other. Manchester United will fight against Manchester City. Liverpool will fight against Arsenal. And yet the week prior to that, they were all united together behind this patriotic cause. So people will come together for different reasons and different notions. But they, were, they are all superficial. And they, were, they are all temporary. The only thing that is profound and the only thing that is worthy, that is worth people, human beings coming together is Quran and Sunnah. Nothing more, nothing less. Is the worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is, why, that is where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam succeeded in bringing all of the different clans and all of the different tribes together that fought each other for generations, for decades, over petty things, over trivial matters, over silly and laughable things. But yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came along and united all of those people under the banner of Quran and Sunnah. That was it. And it was this strength of unity that they had when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa passed away and when he was there that Islam spread because of it throughout the East and throughout the West. So the, the similitude of this idea of the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, 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 a, is a little bit like a, a drowning people or people who are in deep water having difficulty in survival. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the benevolent, he stretches out his, you know, his arm or stretches out his rope full of strength. And you find that if the people who are in difficulty, are in hardship, or are, are, are drowning, if they are then in cooperation with each other, they all have a better chance of survival. But if each individual only thinks about themselves, and are, is only concerned about themselves, only that individual will survive, and perhaps everybody else will drown. But the whole community as a whole, you know, the people as a whole have a better chance of survival if they work together. This again is illustrated in the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu in the hadith of Safina, where Muhammad sallallahu said that this, the similitude of these people are like uh, people on two, on a, on a ship that has two decks. And there are people on the upper deck, there are people on the lower deck. And those that are on the upper deck need to come and get water from the lower deck. And what they decide to do, say this is too much and it's too fussy, it's too difficult, it's too hardship. It's too much hard. It's too, it's, 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 it's hardship for them. So they try to drill a hole in order to get the water, not realizing that this will affect them and it will affect the other deck. And Muhammad Sallallahu said that if the other deck does not go and stop those people from doing what they are doing, they will both drown. So they have to work in tandem with each other, in cooperation with each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed us of this duty and this responsibility that we must hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, we must not be divided. And there is a great deal of division amongst us as Muslims today. So what do we do about this? Let's perhaps take some examples of the Messenger of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of how he did unite people together. Now, of course, we are in, we are in a situation where we are, a, we are a minority living in the UK. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was no different when they became Muslims in Mecca. They were also living as a minority in Mecca. And in fact, when they went to Medina as well, you know, they were also living as a minority. A lot of people perhaps don't know, but when the Muslims went to Medina, 
and the first wasiqa, the first constitution was established in Medina, the Muslims in terms of numbers were a minority. We were not a majority at that time. Muhammad Sallallahu and the companions weren't majority in number. That there were 80 or 90 percent of the population and they decided to uh, establish a constitution. In fact, Muhammad Sallallahu and the companions in Medina, when he was responsible and in charge of Medina, and established a constitution, i.e. the first Khilafah, the first Islamic state in Medina, we were actually a minority. In terms of numbers, the Muslims were a minority. But it was the strength of the idea and the strength of the call that the rest of the people completely subdued. The Jewish tribes, they accepted. They had their own interests. Why? Because they had their war with Christianity. So they decided to try to side with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, As did the other Arab tribes as well. Each one of the tribes had their own interests. But they all were subdued by the call of the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And when this was practically implemented, all the rules and the regulations of Islam was practically implemented in front of their very eyes. They all started to become Muslims in their droves. But we were a minority at that time. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was a minority in, in Mecca and Medina, particularly when he migrated to Medina, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tried to establish this bond between the people. And it was something which was unique, something which was non-existent before. What used to exist at that time was a very strong tribalistic bond that I am only loyal to my tribe. And I will fight with my tribe against another tribe irrespective of the consequences and irrespective of the reasons. So a funny example has been given where you find that the two tribes were fighting amongst each other for a period of almost 40 years. Why? Because of two, they say either two donkeys or two camels or two horses, they decided to mate with each other from each tribe. So one tribe considered its donkey to be far superior than the other. So one strayed and they mated and why did they mate? And they started to fight each other. Literally fight each other and kill each other. And this took place for a period of 40 years, which is laughable in today's day and age. It's laughable that how is it that people can fight each other on something so trivial for a period of 40 years. But if we ask ourselves the question, our situation is not different today. Tribes, groups and organizations and countries will fight each other for trivial things, for absolutely trivial things. Pakistan and Bangladesh will fight each other over something so trivial. Pakistan and India, Pakistan and perhaps Afghanistan will fight each other over something so trivial. The Turks and the Kurds will fight each other over something so trivial and superficial. In the past, we find that Morocco and Algeria fighting each other over something trivial. Saudi Arabia and Yemen fighting each other for decades and generations over something so trivial. Something which they never established. These lines and borders that existed were there established by some old drunk Englishman sitting there with his cigar many, many years ago with a ruler and a pen deciding this is left and that's right. This flag will go there and that flag will go there. Before the concept of nation state before the United Nations, before 47. And just carving up these countries for their own people. And then Muslims came along, this is mine, this is theirs, and they started to fight each other. And millions have been killed because of this. Millions. And today, the situation with the Arab Spring is not different. The fighting and the killing over something so trivial. And only in hindsight, when we can look back and we say, why did they fight for that? How is it that nobody could stop them for fighting over something so silly and so trivial, not profound at all? So at that time, people used to fight over things that were silly. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he migrated to uh, uh, Medina, he established this bond between the people. You know, it made this unison between different couples. Different couples from different tribes. With this brother perhaps from one tribe and another brother from another tribe. So an example has been given where Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi established a bond between Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Sa'ad ibn Rabia. Abdurrahman ibn Awf was somebody who was a businessman. <coughs> and Sa'ad ibn Rabia was a rich man from the Ansar. Abdurrahman ibn Awf from the Muhajirin. So when they all came, and they came with nothing. 
You know, they say that the only person from all of those that migrated from Mecca to Medina that was able to carry something that was worthwhile carrying was Uthman ibn Affan. He could carry whatever he could and he carried as much of his goods that he could. And he was perhaps one of the richest amongst them. But the rest of them, they couldn't carry. And whatever they could carry, they had. And they came with literally nothing, empty-handed. So they left their properties. You know, they left their houses. They left their businesses. They left their wealth and their money behind. They came with nothing. Absolutely nothing. And a lot of us today cannot perhaps understand that concept. You know, because not many of us have left our countries and left everything behind. Houses that we owned. How long does it take to pay off a mortgage? 25 years? Normal mortgage. 20, 25 years? You know, so that's, somebody's got a mortgage, which is obviously not halal, by the way. Somebody's got a mortgage, but it takes them 25 years to have their own property, their own home. They've got to leave it then. So imagine you're working for 25 years. You know, day and night you're going to work your own business. And you've got to pay for this mortgage. You've got to pay for this house. You're paying this mortgage. And after years of paying for this mortgage, it becomes yours. Then you've got to leave your property. Then you've got to leave your house. You've got to leave your wealth. And you've got to leave your business. Leave everything that you have worked for. For, you know, for, for, for years. And just leave empty handed and go to a place. Somebody naturally will have a fear. So this Muhaj- these, 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 these uh, uh, Ashaba Rasulullah, the Muhajireen, when they left, they left with nothing. They arrived in Mecca and the only people that could help them was the Ansar. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided to build this bond between them by making couples from them. So he said to Sa'ad ibn Rabia that this is your partner. And even at that time, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that half of what he had would be given to Abdurrahman ibn Awf. And for those amongst them that were married with more than one wives, they used to, they were, uh, they were they, some of them had said to the companions from Muhajirin that I will give up my wife for you. Choose whichever one you like. Abdurrahman ibn Auf in this situation uh, rejected everything from Sa'ad ibn Rabia. He said, no, I don't need anything. Just show me where the marketplace is. That's all I need. Just show me. And he was a well, you know, the, 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 the people from Makkah were well-established businessmen. They used to say that it could turn the sand to gold and sell it. They were well-established businessmen. So he just said, from Makkah, he said, just show me where the marketplace is. He went to the marketplace and next thing you know, he's doing business, he's buying and selling. He's sending caravans to Syria. And then he finds, uh, you know, a Madanese uh, sister, a woman, and he marries her. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met him sometime later and said, where are you going? You know, he smelled very nice because I just got married. I think he had hina in his hand and on his beard. He just, I, I just got married. He goes, you just come over from Mecca, empty-handed. You know, what did you give her as a dowry? He said, I gave her a piece of gold as a dowry. So he, they were well-established businessmen. So not, every, not all of them accepted the offer. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this bond between them to establish this unity. And that was very, very important. It was very important to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not only politically, because he wanted to show the surrounding tribes around, around Medina at the time that the Muslims are strong and they are unified. But also internally, also to ensure that there is brotherhood amongst them. There is brotherhood between them. And this brotherhood is not based upon the color of your skin. It's not based upon the fact that you're from the same family. It's not based upon the fact that you have the same parents. Not based upon the fact that you're from the same nation, but based upon one thing and one thing alone, that is Quran and Sunnah. That again was illustrated after the Battle of Badr. When Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took many of the prisoners of war. One of the prisoners of war was the brother of Musab ibn Umar. Now this was all, <coughs> Musab ibn Umar's family, his mother was also from a very rich family. So now when they're tying up, you know, the brother of Musab ibn Umar, and as he is passing by, checking the prisoners of war, he meets his brother. You know, it's almost like there's a line of, you know, soldiers that have been captured from the Quraysh. And he's checking these soldiers to ensure that they are treated fairly. And then he comes along his brother. Then of course the first thing that Musab's brother is going to say, well, help me. I'm your brother, help me out. He's tying me up. 
And what would you expect somebody in today's day and age to do and say? Because this idea, this notion of brotherhood based upon belief is not existent in the Muslim community today. It's not existent today. Particularly in our situation today. People will find other type of benefits to be more important than the benefit of the unity based upon Quran and Sunnah. And that is the only thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to be unified upon. Nothing else. All other types of unity, not only are they superficial, but it's something which is not allowed in our deen. Types of unity based upon something else, such as patriotism, such as family, such as blood, such as nationalism. The only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave any status, any nobility to, was Islam, was Quran and Sunnah. That's the only type of unity and the only type of status which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave any credence to. Nothing else. So now when Musa bin Umar is there and he's seen his brother and his brother said, help him. In reply to that, Musa bin Umar said to the person who was tying him up and he was a slave that was tying him up that tie him even tighter. Why? Because his mother is very rich. And she would pay a lot of money as ransom for this person. And his brother is shocked. Absolutely shocked. That I'm your blood brother. We have the same mother. And there you are saying that tie me up even tighter. And he said, yeah. He said, because this person who's tying you up, who may be a slave, is more of a brother to me than you are. In that same battle, the battle of Badr, we have the example of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was of course the companion, the most noble companion of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He had a son. The son was not Muslim. And they were fighting in that same battlefield. They were fighting in that same battle in the Battle of Badr. And afterwards, when Abdul uh, the, the son of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq did embrace Islam, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his son came to his father and said, you know, I saw you in the battle of Badr. You know, my eyes caught your eyes. I saw you, my eyes caught a glimpse of you in the battle of Badr. But I tried to avoid you. Why? Because I didn't want to fight you. And I didn't want to kill you. So I tried to avoid you. So for this person, the unity or this, this, this form of brotherhood existed based upon blood. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq then replied to him, that by Allah, if I had seen you on the battle of Badr, I would have killed you. If I had seen you, and he's, that's his own son that he's talking about. If I had seen you, he said, by Allah, if I had seen you in the battle of Badr, because I didn't see you. But if I had seen you in the battle of Badr, I would have killed you. Again, illustrating that, you know, and they were fighting for Islam. They were fighting for the fighting with the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Fighting to ensure that Islam was superior. So again, illustrating that the only type of brotherhood or the only type of unity that should exist in the Muslim community must be based upon Quran, must be based upon Sunnah. Nothing more and nothing less. And there are ample examples like this in the history of Islam. Not one or two, but many examples like this in the history of Islam where this brotherhood existed purely based upon Islam, purely based upon Quran and Sunnah. You know, when uh, Bilal al-Habashi was being tortured in Mecca, and he was just a slave, slave, of an, an Abyssinian slave. You know, even amongst the slaves, they have their different darajats, you know, different levels. Who's a good slave? And we even have this today. Unfortunately, you go to Saudi Arabia, and everybody who's not Saudi is a second-class citizen. But even amongst those second class citizens, they have their levels, you know, these, these darajat levels. Who is a better uh, uh, non Saudi citizen or who is, who is a better miskin, because everybody else is miskin, and who is a worse miskin. But even amongst the slaves at that time, there was this levels, if you like. And he was an Abyssinian slave. Ya Abu Bakr as Sadiq, when he became Muslim and embraced Islam, did not hesitate. To pay which, 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 whatever amount of money was necessary to ransom Bilal al Habashi. Didn't consider that he was a black man. He didn't consider that he was a slave, a lowly slave. 
He didn't consider that he may not be of any worth anymore after, he, after the way that he's been tortured and humiliated in the society. But he liberated him and then he freed him and said, you are now a free man purely because of the fact that he wanted to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loved Allah and his messenger. He understood what it meant that if I do this action, this action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love it. So I will do this because Allah, he loves it. So when we do something in the dunya that our spouse or our family members, they love, we must remember that we must also do actions and embark upon something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves. So if your wife likes flowers and you take on flowers, because you know that it will make her happy and she will love it. So you do an action to make her happy. In the same way, we must do something to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just have the fear of not doing the haram, but also in order to love Allah, we do something which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in another verse, Then goes on to say in another verse in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again commanded us in this verse that if you find that there are two factions of believers amongst you that are quarreling, then make a settlement between them. We find that are Muslims that are arguing, groups, organizations or countries, people from different areas that are arguing and fighting amongst each other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders upon us that we make a settlement between them. And this was so important to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa After establishing this unity between different people in Mecca, and then all of them migrating together to Medina, and then establishing this unison between two different individuals in Medina, and this bond of unity between them, so profound that somebody would give up his wife for this person. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know him from Adam. You know, this is just a normal person, a person that's come from a completely different country to him, from a completely different tribe. Yet he's come there and he's willing to give up his wife or wealth and house and business for this individual. This is the kind of bond that Muhammad Sallallahu established. You find that there was a, an incident in, the ta- in, 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 in Medina where the Awuz and the Khazraj, they started to argue amongst each other. And this was instigated by a Jewish boy. He went there. Is that too radical? Okay. Just thought maybe. Typical. Huh? Typical. Okay. I just thought I said something so radical. I'm gonna get you guys banned. So this was instigated by a Jewish boy. And it was done intentionally. I, I don't remember the name from the top of my head. But he went there and he used poetry in order to incite amongst these different tribes the type of fighting that they used to fight before. So he used to remind one tribe of how they were humiliated by this tribe using poetry. And then remind this tribe of how they were humiliated by this tribe. Until he ignited amongst them this patriotic and nationalistic feeling. How dare he talk about this tri- our tribe? Instead of making this individual the target, the problem, they then, this, this, this patriotic and nationalistic feeling that they had before this, tribalistic feeling that they had before was ignited. And then they started to say, Silah on Silah, take out our, our swords. And then there was almost as if there was this battle between these two tribes. And all Muslims, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard about this that they were about to fight each other. And there were calls for arms, call for war between these Muslim tribes that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had made so much effort, strived so much to bring together, about to fight and kill each other. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came running. He came running to them. And his face was red. Tears almost dropping, you know, on his cheeks, falling down from his eyes, saying to them, that why have you gone back and I'm still amongst you and you're fighting with each other, gone back to your jahiliyyah. Just these few actions of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa illustrates the importance of this brotherhood. 
not only the importance of brotherhood, but the importance to of ensuring that when there is an argument, a quarrel between different groups and organizations, you must try to nip it in the bud immediately and try to bring the people together. What actions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? First of all, he, he he went running to these people. He heard immediately that the people were fighting; they're about to fight each other. Based upon what? What was it they were going to fight about? That my tribe is bigger than yours? It's no different to the riots, isn't it? Or just this, 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 you know, postcode wars that take place. My posse is bigger than your posse, you know? My group is better than your group. I'm from this area, I'm from that area. It's, it's no different today. My country is better than your country, you know? Saudi Arabia is more noble than Yemen. Yemen's a poor country. Bangladesh is a poor country. Indonesia is a poor country. So we can oppress it, we can suppress it. Which is no different to what they were doing then. That one tribe is better than another tribe. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came running to them. His cheeks were red with anger that they're about to fight. And surprised and shocked they're about to fight and kill each other. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about to cry and shed tears. Why? Because they're about to fight and kill each other. So this is what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so concerned about. So worried about. That the Muslims do not fight amongst each other. Do not kill each other. Do not quarrel amongst each other. That's why it is said that when a Muslim is fighting you, the best thing that you can do is walk away. He hits you, the best thing that you can do is walk away. Yes, we have in our Sharia the right to defend ourselves. But the greater man is the one who walks away. Why? Because this idea that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established of brotherhood between Muslim is the greatest social idea of Islam. In our social system, in this social idea, it's the greatest idea. This brotherhood and unity based upon, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes you can, you can see this when you go to an area and there are Muslims from different countries, particularly when you go to Hajj Umrah. And it's such a beautiful and profound feeling. You know, somebody who you don't know from a completely different country. In fact, he does he probably doesn't even speak your language. Doesn't even speak your language. But he's praying next to you in the haram. And all of a sudden you have this overwhelming feeling of that this this person, this individual is a brother like any other person, like your own blood brother if he's a Muslim. And you will try to help them and defend them as much as you can. Why? Because you know he's praying in the same direction to you. He's worshiping the same Allah as you. He reads the same Quran as you. He follows the same messenger as you. And you get this feeling, particularly in that situation, when you're either in Hajj or Umrah. There are Muslims from all, and this is where they say that even Malcolm X changed from his nation of Islam that he was before, had this racist idea of the white man being the devil. And you know the black nation, so on and so forth, the whole culture that they have. And he went then to uh, Saudi Arabia and he performed the Hajj or the Umrah or the pilgrimage. And there he said, I ate and I drank from the same cup in the plate of somebody who was from a completely different country to me. And immediately, just from this idea, he realized, just from that one example and those few actions, he realized. That this is what Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he brought. He brought for us a religion, a deen that was for every color and every race and every gender, from every corner of every country. It didn't matter which language you spoke. It didn't matter what the color of your skin was. So this is the most, uh, uh, the greatest social ideal of our of our religion of Islam. This whole notion, this whole idea of unity. There are a few things that we, my dear brothers and sisters, can do. To ensure that we as Muslims stick together, just two or three practical steps that I think are lacking today for us as Muslims. You know, first of all, we must always defend our brothers and sisters in every situation, and that is so important. It should not be for us that only if my own mother or my own brother or my own wife or children are suffering because of persecution. Then I only react. Then our brothers and sisters are suffering in Syria, you know, in Egypt, in other countries around the world, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, and sometimes we don't react because it is not our own blood. So perhaps let's 
put this idea in our own heads for a moment. That if somebody had phoned you and said, you know, your own house now has been occupied where your mother is at home and your father's there alone. How many of us would sit in this room, carry and listen to me? No, I'd be talking to the walls. I'd be talking to the walls. Why? Because you do run home to defend them, your own parents. But that is the situation in our Muslim countries. That is the situation in our Muslim countries today, brothers. So we've got to ask ourselves that is it that our notion of brotherhood is based upon something other than Quran and Sunnah? Would we react in a different way if it was the case that our parents or our family or our own loved ones were being persecuted? So we need to ensure that we try to defend our own community irrespective of who it is and help them irrespective of who it is. And I don't only mean physically, but I also mean verbally in terms of backbiting as well. Because this idea of, you know, and unfortunately this is one thing that really exists in the Muslim community today that we slander and put down other groups or individuals and organizations or imams without to think about it. And then we carry this message on to other people. So it either becomes a place where we are being entertained because somebody else is backbiting. Oh, you know this brother did this. Oh, you know that sister did this. Yeah, she said this and she wears a scarf like this and this brother, he did this and he did that. You know, this group says this and that group says that. That imam says this and that imam says this. And it becomes a place of entertainment where somebody else is backbiting or slandering an individual or a group or an imam and we are there just listening and this is particular I say for our dear sisters why? because they have a habit of lending an ear when backbiting is involved they have a habit of lending an ear when it is involved and carrying this message it is so dangerous so dangerous for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that even the one who becomes shaheed he will still have to answer for the backbiting you know the one who dies in the martyr and there and we know all of the noble status the martyr has in fact this status of a martyr this noble status of a martyr is in every culture in every culture it's not it's not something muslims don't have a monopoly in this particular status you know in every culture when somebody becomes a martyr for their cause you know, it's like this woman on, that died in, on, during the marathon. She was like a martyr. She got a million pounds. She only wanted 500 quid. She just wanted 500 quid and she's got a million pounds because she died as a martyr. So this idea, this notion of a martyr is universal. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still ask this martyr, this shaheed, about the ghiba, about the backbiting. So we need to be very careful about speaking about other people Number one. And number two, when other people are being spoken about. So we should even leave that conversation when people are being backbited or defend. Muslims don't do that. Rather, we carry this news from place to place. And that is wrong. So this is one of the things that we can do is defend our community. Defend our community, not only physically, but also from our tongues as well. Whether it's us backbiting or somebody else. Number two is when there is a dispute amongst people. Try to bring these people together. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us. That when, when factions of uh, Muslim community are fighting, quarreling amongst each other, it becomes a duty to bring them together. And we know that lying is not allowed in a situation. In, in, lying is not allowed in Islam except in certain circumstances. And this is one of them. Where I can lie. To say that, in fact, brother, this, this brother actually loves you. You know, he didn't say that about you. Perhaps you misunderstood. Or this sister, she cares for you. She didn't say that. You misunderstood what she was saying. And I know that I'm lying. Why? And I'm doing that in order to bring people together. In order to ensure that that unity is there. And number three is overlook our differences. This is so important. You know, people get bogged down with the most trivial things, trivial matters. You know, and for example, a scholar may have a whole host of good, you know, fatawa, you know, uh, edicts and books and lectures 
on various different topics. But he may say one or two things which are not pleasing to your ears. And you will dismiss that completely. Dismiss that scholar completely. Or dismiss an organization completely because you may disagree with them on one or small thing. One or, small, one or two small, small things or small issues. You cut off complete brotherhood or sisterhood because somebody said something that you didn't like. Somebody said something that you didn't like. Where overall this person is a very good Muslim. What we, need to, what we need to try to do is try to overlook our differences, overlook our disagreements, particularly in this time, in, particularly this time in today's day and age. In other times, when we have security, when we have um, uh, this, 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 this uh, Sharia or Khilafah, when the Muslim Ummah is being defended, then yes, we can discuss and debate, no problem. Even the dis- disagreements can become public and open. Why? To eradicate them. But in today's day and age, in our situation today, it is imperative that we overlook our differences. Why? Because the minute that the disbelievers can see that we as Muslims are divided, the minute that they can see that we are divided, they will use that as a tool to divide us even more and put a wedge between us. This whole notion of divide and rule is a classic British Western tool that they have used in order to divide the Muslim countries. It has been used for generations. In fact, it was one of the reasons that they used, and there are many reasons, but one of the things or the tools that they used in order to divide the Muslim Khilafah, the Islamic State. And it was one of the the tools that they used in order to carve it up. So they used to go to the Turks and say one thing to the Turks. Why? Because they know they had some disagreement with the Arabs. And then go to the Arabs and say one thing to them. And then go to the people of Hind and say one thing to them. So you should use this idea of divide and rule. That we know that I can't take this whole mammoth, you know, this whole nation as a whole and eat it up. So what I will do, I will carve it up. He has a dispute with him and I will use that for for my own benefit. That's exactly what they did. And they are doing that today. So they will label one group or one organization or one scholar as an extremist or a fundamentalist or a fanatic in the hope that he will be ostracized by the rest of the community. So the rest of the community will not have nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with him or them. And then they will target them. Why? Because support is not coming from anywhere. They've already been ostracized. They've been labeled. And the clever way that they do it is they will not say that this person is an extremist or a terrorist. They will get you to do it. And my dear brother, unfortunately, will fall for the trap. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because he has this simple, abject cowardness in him. Why? I'm too scared to say the truth. I'm too afraid to say the truth because I'm a simple coward. I don't fear Allah. But then it will become his turn. When this group or this individual or this scholar has been put away in prison or been killed or whatever, then they will come for you. And once they're finished with you, they will go to somebody else. And that is how they will carve up the Muslim countries and the Muslim groups and the Muslim scholars one by one. Why? Carve them up and then have full control and dominance over them. And the only way that we can overcome that, yeah, we have disagreements. Yeah, we have ikhtilaf. We have disagreements. We have ikhtilaf. And this in Sharia is completely allowed. But the only way that we can overcome that is overlook our disagreements. Overlook our differences. Overlook the things that we disagree about. And let them be. And look at the things that we do agree about. And let's move forward. You know, we say let bygones be bygones. Let's forget it for the moment. Let's park it up, our disagreement on the side for a moment. Let's look at how we can become united and let's move forward. When we have a united face, then it becomes difficult for them to oppress us. It becomes difficult for them (coughs) to suppress us. It becomes difficult for them to occupy us. So the first thing that they did when they went to Afghanistan, was asked the countries next door, are you going to intervene? Pakistan unfortunately said, no, we're not. In fact, you can even use our base if you like. Yes, sir, yes, sir, free bags full, sir. So they knew there was no support coming for Afghanistan at all. So what did they do? They occupied. The same thing they did with Iraq. The first thing they did was to ask the surrounding countries, what are you going to do? 
Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Jordan and the rest of them. They said, no, they're not going to intervene. I mean, they have a free reign to go and occupy because nobody else is going to come to its aid. And once they got in, they did exactly the same thing on a domestic level. They carved it up on a domestic level. So they labeled one group and they supplied weapons to the other group. Then they labeled this group and supplied weapons to this group or supplied finance to this group through different arms and different organizations. And they carved it up even more. And once it was carved up, once it was weak, once it was on its knees and bleeding, they left. And now they did the same thing in Afghanistan. And they will do the same thing in the rest of the Muslim countries. Why? Because of this disunity. But the moment, if those countries, imagine those countries said, no, we're not going to allow you to occupy any of these countries. We will react. We will retaliate. They will think twice about it. They will think twice about it. Why? Because they know there are going to be consequences. Not from one, but from many fronts. And no country likes to fight many fronts. No country in the world, however powerful it may be, likes to fight more than one front. So if they are fighting in one country, in the other countries, they know we will react. We will retaliate. They are going to be fighting on multiple fronts. And they are going to be reluctant to do that. Why? Because they can see there's a degree of unity. Even though we know there's division. So much division that there's two countries. So much division, there are two flags and two languages. But when it comes to this fundamental issue of occupation, fundamental issue of trying to exterminate this group of people or this country, the other Muslims say, no, we're not going to allow this. I'm not going to allow it. And this can filter down in our own community in every way, shape and form, brothers in every way. So when somebody's been attacked even by Muslims, you know, those Muslims did this, don't, no, don't tolerate that. Don't, I don't accept that. They're my brothers, they're my sisters, and I will defend them, irrespective of the consequences. So that's the last thing, that, and, and there are many practical examples. But out of the three, that's the last thing that we can do as Muslims, is that overlook our disagreements and overlook our differences. And finally, just as an example of how important this is, and how wise we can be when, it, when we want to overlook our uh, disagreements and our uh, differences. I give an example in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan was the Khalif in his time. And dur <coughs> during his time, during the Hajj season, when he was in Mina, he prayed four rakah for Dhuhr and Asr. It's a fiqh matter. He didn't he did combine them. When you go to Hajj, when you're in Mina, you normally pray two and two and you combine them. But Uthman ibn Affan was the Khalif, was the leader. And he didn't combine And he prayed separately. Prayed the four of Zuhr and the Asr separately. So now some of the other companions are arguing amongst themselves, why did Uthman do that? Who gave him the right to do that? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do that. So then they're arguing amongst themselves, okay, you go to him and you go to him, you go and ask him. I think finally... If I can remember correctly, it was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. They finally convinced him to go to him and ask him why he did that. So he asked him, why is, the, why is it the case that you prayed separately? This is not something which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi done. And by this time, the rest of the companions <coughs> that were outside had already prayed themselves. As the Sharia Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, they prayed two and two. And this is a serious matter. It's in fiqh. This is how we do our hajj. And he gave him an explanation. And according to Abdullah bin Masood, it was a weak explanation. He says something about my house is not traveling distance and I just got married and my wife is here as well. And he gave him some excuse. And Abdullah bin Masood was a faqih himself. So he responded to Uthman in every one of his answers that he gave. That you are wrong here, you are wrong here and you are wrong here. It's incorrect what you said. And rather you should pray two and two. He said, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to stick to me. I'm just going to stick to praying for him for Abdullah bin Masood was so wise. He had his own group of people and companions that asked him to go in as their leader outside. So when he went out, what did he say to them? He gave up his opinion and said, I'm going to pray the way that Uthman he prayed. He understood the implication of disunity at that time. And if I now go out and I say now that he is wrong and he's the Khalif, there will be a rebellion there and there will be disunity amongst the Muslims. So he was willing to give up an opinion that he legitimately believed was the right opinion. To such an extent, he believed that Uthman ibn Affan was wrong 
because he rebuffed him. He, re, you know, he, he gave him he gave him an answer to his own three points that he had made. He said, "You are wrong here." And yet he gave up that opinion and he prayed. He went outside and prayed again. He said, "I'm going to pray behind the imam and I'm going to pray for." And this is not really heard of. And Uthman ibn Affan, he, gave, he had his own uh, reasons and own uh, excuses of why he did that. And there are some, some analysis of why he did that. But the point is that the companions gave up their legitimate opinion. Legitimate opinion. For an opinion that they never considered to be valid. That he rebutted. That he disagreed with and said that you were wrong here. And still carried on praying for to ensure that there were unity amongst the Muslims. So even when you think you are right... Even when you think you have the correct opinion. I've got all the evidences of the world, brother. And I've got the biggest scholar behind me. Even when you think you are right. If it means that there's going to be a degree of serious disunity. Then give up your opinion. Give up your opinion as long as it is within the, the realm of Sharia. Within the realm of Quran and Sunnah. So our unity, my dear brothers and sisters, can only be based upon Quran and Sunnah. Anything other than that, anything other than that, is a waste of time. Waste of time and waste of space and very superficial and it's only going to be temporary. And only with this unity based upon Quran and Sunnah will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala baraka and give this ummah insha'Allah strength and victory. Wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Allah. Right inside, or tell the kids to pass over any brothers, just raise your hands. How, how far do you take what you just said? Uh, last point in regards to agreeing on the point where you think it's wrong. How far do you take that for the sake of unity? Before you, in, in regards to, you might think that. Going with it, like this, like this means Allah. So the question is basically, the brothers are asking, how far do you agree to a point that you disagree with? Basically, you give up your opinion um, before it starts, or it could displease Allah. I, and that's a good point because I, I think each case needs to be assessed on its own merit. Although there's a general principle that we need to overlook our disagreements and our and our differences and come together. And the key point here is Quran and Sunnah. The key point here is the Quran and the Sunnah. So the example of Uthman ibn Affan, it was within the fiqh that he had his opinion. You know, and he's the, he was Amir al-Mu'mineen as well. And he gave his reasons. You know, at the beginning they used to pray for, and then they changed later on. So he, that was his reason. There is some analysis of why he did that, but it was within the realm of the Quran. So it was within the, 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 the fiqh and the sharia that is, uh, that is allowed. Now, there are many examples where you find that there are people jumping on bandwagons doing something which the Sharia does not allow at all. And I will, I will give an example now of, of the voting campaign. Hmm. We've just had the, 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 the mayor being elected, Boris, has come back into power. <clears throat> so, um, and, you know, and a lot of Muslims are saying that, you know, we should vote and so on and so forth. And there are Muslims that are saying that we shouldn't. Now, in my opinion, this is something which in Sharia is not allowed to vote at all for any MP whatsoever. I'm firmly on this opinion. And I will never side with anybody who says that voting is allowed. Because of the fact that I don't think that the opinion is based upon Quran and Sunnah. If you have a look at a lot of the evidences that people have used in order to justify this, it is an opinion that's based purely, in my opinion, on pragmatism practicality and pragmatism what may or may not happen not based upon some firm evidence some nas, some firm evidence of Quran and Sunnah that in, perhaps in this situation it may be allowed so you need to assess each situation you know uh, on its own merit <clears throat> and decide that is there a if you like a uh, um, um, what we call does he have an excuse of a difference of opinion based upon some dalil, based upon some ayah, or based upon some hadith. And if he does, and if you are insistent and adamant on your opinion, and this will cause a disunity, and there will be a far greater chance of unity if you were to jump on the opinion of this scholar or this imam, then, then my, my suggestion is that you should. 
but it has to be firmly based upon Quran and Sunnah, and that is the key matter. So whenever you assess something, you look at it. Is this based upon Quran and Sunnah? If it's not, then you leave it, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you please in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that is that, that is sufficient. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will bring the unity Himself, inshallah. Yeah. Um, if, a, if a sister has been doing voluntary favors all year since Ramadan, but has recently stopped past two months, and she continue. can she continue? Okay, that's quite. There's another question. What rights does a divorced woman parents have on her? And please, can you repeat? from what surah you were referring to okay <clears throat> if a sister has been doing voluntary fasts not favors oh fasts okay fasts, yeah if sister has been doing voluntary fasts all year since ramadan but has recently stopped in the past two months can she continue i am guessing from this question the voluntary fasts are the fasts of monday and thursday and the fasts of the free days in the in the middle of the month yes she can continue there's no harm in her um, if she stopped for her own reasons that is fine and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes the action of the individual um, if it's continuous and I think there's a small point here that you know we should try in our deen to push ourselves to what we are able to do continuously Sometimes when we try and we read some of the examples of our companions, you know, their status and their behavior and their action is so high, and we try to reach that, you don't want to burn out. You know, it's very, very dangerous and very easy to burn out. Uh, it's a very, very noble thing to do, to continuously fast, but we should try to make it consistent. And that is the action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He likes and He loves, even if it's a small amount. You know, so if you regularly give in on Friday, you know, some sadaqah and, and you think if you increase the amount of sadaqah that you give, it's going to break the bank, then don't increase it. Only give the amount that you're regularly given and, it's, and that's more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she can continue. What rights to it does a divorced woman's parents have, parents have on her? I'm not understanding the question, but I think it's in relation to getting married again. Um, no, she's divorced, can she do whatever she oh, wants? Yeah, I know, I, I, think, I, I think from the question, what she's Probably. asking is that if she wants to get married again, should... Um, does she need to Yeah, does she need permission from her parents? No, she doesn't need permission. That's the opinion that I follow, that uh, when she gets married again after the first marriage, she doesn't need permission from her parents. But the rights that the parents have on a divorced woman or a married woman are really identical, are the same. Mm. You, you treat them with respect, you help them and you assist them as much as you can. Mm. If they are old and they are needy, that you try to help them. Of course you need your permission, you need the permission of your husband before you can leave the house. But a good husband is not going to say to you, no, your mother's disabled during the day, you're at work, I need to go and help her for a few hours. A good husband will say, yeah, you can do that. You know, and you do that as a voluntary uh, uh, duty towards your parents. But in terms of rights, the rights don't change whether you get married or not. You still must treat them with respect. You still must help them and assist them as much as you can, your parents, whether you're married or whether you are single or whether you are divorced. And please, can you repeat from what Surah? Surah Hujarat was one of the Surahs about where Allah Subhanahu says, وَإِن تَعِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَطَلُوا if two factions amongst the believers are fighting, that's Surah Al-Hujarat, verse number 9. And the beginning where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the fear is in Surah Ali Muran, verse number 3, uh, Surah number 3, verse 102, and then going on to 103. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَسَمُوا بِحَبْلِ الْجَمِعِينَ That hold fast to the rope of Allah, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And do not be divided. <laughs> Another one, this is just translating because it was a really touch. It's saying, well, How would the Prophet Sallallahu how would the Prophet Sallallahu would want us to um, bring back an Islamic state? Basically, it's, it's, it's in Turkish, though. In Isla an Islamic state. Yeah, how would he want us to bring back the Islamic state? That's the question. You know, <clears throat> obviously, you don't know how he would want it, but it's just. I mean, the thing is that the, 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 the simple answer to that is that Muhammad Sallallahu would ask, hmm. would expect from us to follow in his footsteps would expect from us as Muslims 
live in today's day and age, however difficult it may be, to follow in his footsteps. And he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa established an Islamic state in Medina the way that he struggled in Mecca. That is, in my opinion, the method to establish the Islamic state. He established a small band, a small group of people in Mecca. He taught them the fundamentals and the basic, the foundations of our deen. He went on and he asked them and he himself went and enjoined that which is good and forbid that which is evil. The good and the bad of the individual as well as that of a state as well. As well as that of the leaders as well. And then he gained some kind of material, physical support. In order, a backing from an army. Those tribes, you know. Ithni Ashara Naqib and the 12 tribes that came, the Naqib, the leaders from Medina that came from Yathrib to give him material support to ensure that he wasn't going to get harmed and his people were not going to get harmed. And in the event that they do get harmed and Quraysh do rise up, they are there to defend him physically. They are there to shed blood if necessary. That is the way that the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa established the first Islamic state. How and where the Islamic State will come, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows. Only He knows. And one of the factors that will prevent the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our own behavior. There's one thing that this is a method, you know, that this is how I'm going to pray. I have a particular method. But it may be that my salat is not accepted. It may be that my wudu is not accepted. Why? Because there's something preventing that from being accepted from Allah. So I'm enjoying the good and I'm forbidding the evil. And, I, and I'm with an organization of Muslims, with scholars, and I'm doing what I can. But us as a community, there's something there that is preventing the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is disobedience to Allah. That is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a cause for Allah's victory to come upon us. Our obedience to Allah. And the unity is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The unity of the Muslim ummah is a command from Allah. So however difficult it may be for us that we don't have a leader to order all of us that we should or we shouldn't do. And that's what happens when you have a leader. You know, and the, the contemporary example that we have is of Afghanistan. When we had a small Islamic state there for a period of a few years, even though there were so many different factions there, Arabs and non-Arabs there. But when the leader said something, they all followed. And they all submitted. They all said yes. So that political unity existed. When we have that one leader, which is no different to a jama'ah. You know, we have an imam. He says, now it's time to pray, we pray. He decides to read this surah, we pray behind him and he reads that surah. Whether we like it or not. It's too long, but we still stay behind him and we pray because he's the leader, he's the imam. So his opinion that becomes binding upon us, whether we like it or not. So our obedience to Allah is a cause of victory. And our disobedience to Allah is becoming a prevention from the, uh, for, uh, uh, for the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is fundamental, my dear brothers, which is a different topic to the method. You know, this is the, 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 the obedience to Allah is a different topic to the method itself. But it's imperative that we try to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I said before, and I will say again, do not think for a moment that when we do something haram as an individual, that it doesn't affect our community as a whole. It does. Don't ever think that, you know. Sometimes you think, well, I've only, you know, a sister may think, well, I'm only just backbited this individual. Or, you know, I've worn perfume when I've gone out and I shouldn't have. You know, I've taken my scarf off when I shouldn't have. I've slandered this person and I shouldn't have. Between me and Allah, what's it got to do with you? It's got a lot to do with me. Because your disobedience will affect the whole community. Your disobedience to Allah will prevent the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think that I go home and I watch something on the computer or on television which I know is haram but it's only affecting me. It doesn't only affect you. It affects the whole community as a whole. There are many examples of this but now is not the time to 
illustrate them or to mention them, but this is something which is important. Obedience to Allah is vital, is paramount, my dear brothers. And it's conditional, you know, from the, for the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be bestowed upon us. Last, last question, inshallah. You know, you story about the Sahaba and the... And the so if, if... I mean, they're great people and great scholars and, you know... If, if you see... If you're talking about Bidda innovation, you're talking about Quran and Sunnah. People are following Quran and Sunnah, yeah? Mm. If you see someone deviating... Mm. What, you saying that you have to be quiet? Because in my, my opinion, and what I've found, that it does cause disunity. Do you understand me? And it, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I understand, so, yeah. Keep quiet. Like, so basically, about this? the question is, is, if you see someone doing an innovation or something, an innovation, or something blatant, like, yeah. yeah. Do you keep quiet? Because it does cause disunity. Mm-hmm. If you keep quiet, it causes disunity. That's a reverse. I mean, no, no, if you say something, if I say something, if you something, say something, it causes disunity. Oh, if you say something, it causes disunity. Like, okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, you know what, you know what I found, brothers and sisters. Yeah, is that it's not that you are saying something. You know, what the brothers are asking is that if somebody is doing something which is a bid'ah, something which is wrong, and I say something, becomes very antagonistic and argument and fighting and bickering, so it may be better just to leave it. That's not the case. I don't think it's what you say. And I find in a lot of cases, it's how it is said. Mm. You know that. It's not about what you say to the person. It's about how it is said. So you need to be wise enough to be able to illustrate that what uh, this person is doing is wrong. It is like an example that they give about the two grand, the, the, the two grandchildren of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Hassan and Hussein. There was a period when they found that there was an old man, you know, and he was making his wudu properly. And I'm sure in the minds of these two shabab, these two young. Uh, 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 grandchildren of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that this person must have been a Muslim for a long time and there we are as children now going to come and teach him so for years maybe 50, 60 years this old man has been doing wudu in the wrong way and here I come along want to be clever clogs and teach them so what they did was that they went and they asked him if I can remember, they asked him, and they did wudu properly themselves, and they asked him, is this how we should do our wudu? I mean, instead of making him the center of attention, that he's the problem, they put the onus upon them. That they did the wudu, yeah, to make him see well, actually, they're doing it right, and I'm doing it wrong. So it's not necessary what you say, that brother, you shouldn't do this, or you should do this. It's how it is said. Majority of the times, that's what I find. Mm. That it is how you enjoin the good and how you forbid the evil. That's a science by itself. How to enjoin the good and how to forbid the evil is a big science by itself. And it takes a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom to know how to do and say the right thing. And at times perhaps not to say it. Why? Because you may have a chance to say it later. I'll give you an example. If I've got a worker who works with me, and I know he's going to come to work every day. I've employed him for a year. He's got a year contract with me. I'm not going to put the whole burden of Islam, the whole of the Quran and Sunnah on his head. Akhi, you don't even pray. You haven't even got a beard. You don't even fast. You're wearing silk. You're wearing gold rings. And you've got a girlfriend. And you go to disco. And you smoke <laughs> drugs. And you smoke. And you drink. Akhi, you're a girlfriend. Go to hell. <laughs> Cut your head off. <laughs> this guy is going to leave me the next day. I'm not going to have a worker. And he's not going to probably like Islam at all. So what I will do, I will become wise in that I will explain to him over a period of time. Why? Because I know he's going to be with me. And I will explain to him over a period of time how he understands, how it will not become too much for him as well. Mm. And this is something important for us. Why we know that Muhammad Sallallahu in his time taught the companions over a period of years. It wasn't overnight. Islam was revealed in one night, but it then was sent down over periods and over incidents mm. and over a period of time he strengthened them and this is how we should also try and each example obviously each issue has its own example and own merit of how things should and shouldn't be done but I think majority of the times it's how we say something and yes when we say when we see something that's wrong it's haram or kufr or bid'ah it's our responsibility to advise this deen is advice and that's because you love the brother not because you want to prove that you have some spiritual superiority. 
You have religious superiority, intellectual superiority that I know better than you. No, not you or anybody else. People find, have this habit. I want to debate this, I know more than you. No, because you love him and you want him to be on the haqq. And if you do it with that in mind, you may not do it antagonistically. Yeah. I think we'll stop this and we've done a bit long Q&A session. Just a few announcements. Um, obviously, just to remind everyone that we've got a website called helponeumma.com. It's a, a way of unification, bringing obviously everyone together. And shall I just, if you check out the website, it's called help number one and umma.com. Shall I check that out and see if we can get involved with it? It's, it's there for everyone to obviously get involved with. Also, another announcement: please announce the Tuesday sisters' coffee morning. So this Tuesday is at between ten and eleven, and it says manicures will be available as well. Not for the brothers, yes, sisters. Um, and they'll be going for Hadith Qudsi. Hopefully not while they're doing the manicure, yeah. Discrimination. Yeah, I know, subhanAllah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other things going on in the community. We're just trying our best, and we want everyone else to try their best to take these lectures and talks or whatever in mind, and bear that in mind in your day-to-day lives as well, to try and unite the Ummah. And hopefully, Allah alam how long it's going to take. Don't see yourself as insignificant. Because Islam started with one and then two and as the numbers numbers grew slowly, slowly. So everyone bear that in mind that we're not insi- insignificant and we can make a change to unite the Ummah, inshallah. And inshallah we'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa